Hello, Adult Sunday School Leader. Imagine a child opening up a gift on Christmas morning and it was a blender. And the child was supposed to use that blender to help his or her parents with meal preparation. You know, I have a feeling they would be quite disappointed, but that's how it is with spiritual gifts. Not that we're disappointed with them, okay? We're going to be looking at some of the spiritual gifts this week as we continue in the unit called Being an Authentic Church. This is lesson number five called Serving in Christ. The focal passage is out of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7 and 11 through 16. The point is, we are to minister to one another and alongside one another. Well, if you keep your old Sunday school literature or teaching notes, here are some other dates that use this week's lesson, scripture, or at least part of the scripture passages for the week. That would be September 14th, 2014, September 21st, 2014, and August 9th, 2020. Well, let's first look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. That's our first set of scriptures for this lesson. In verse 1, Paul begins uh, this, this half of the letter with the word, therefore. In other words, based on everything I've written so far, do the following. So something to point out here is that the first three chapters of the book are primarily theological, and the last three chapters are pra pragmatic, they're more practical. So Paul is saying, Based on all the theological stuff I've written, here's how to live it out. In light of the gracious riches you've received in Christ, and that was described in the previous chapters, and this reality of the new community called the church, here are your responsibilities. He urged them to live worthy of their calling in the first verse. They must conduct themselves in a way that reflects their new status. There must be humility and gentleness among them, a willingness to submit to the lordship of Jesus. They must have patience, bearing with one another in love, and as verse 2 states, showing tolerance for others and seeking their well-being. Now, let's be honest, that's tough to do a lot of the time, isn't it? If you ever find yourself in a different community and you're looking for a new place to worship, a new church, try to attend a business meeting at the church that you're looking at. You'll definitely see how much love and patience and bearing with one another goes on in that church. Well, in verse 3, Paul wrote that by living this way, they would be able to keep the unity of the Spirit. Now, unity is vital. It's vital for a healthy church. Now, let's remember now, unity is not the same as uniformity. Uniformity is exact sameness. The same look. You know, I can go to a McDonald's here in town. I can get a hamburger here. Or I can go uh, to Clemson, South Carolina and order a McDonald's hamburger. And they are the same. They're uniform. They appear the same. They taste the same. But unity deals with purpose, not appearance. In my church and in my Sunday school class, we have a variety of backgrounds, a variety of races, socioeconomic levels, and, and spiritual gifts. And we're going to get into that here in a little bit. A church of diversity can have unity. I've been playing trombone off and on since I was in junior high, 50 years ago. I was in junior high. That seems impossible. But I've been playing the Pine Bluff Community Band now for about 15 years. We, we have several different instrumentalists, and which represent instruments from brass to woodwinds to percussion. And even in a particular horn section, there are differences. There are different parts. The first trombone part usually is written a little higher, a little higher range than the second trombone part. And all this to say that in any piece of music, any, any piece of music we play, there's, there's a bunch of different things going on, a bunch of different notes being played. Some are high, some are low. Some are playing one rhythm. Some are playing another rhythm. Some are playing the melody, and others are playing the harmony. And sometimes maybe an entire section may not be playing anything, but we're not all doing our own thing. We have diversity in what we play and when we play, but we have unity in our goal to play music that's pleasing to listen to. So this is true with believers as well. We, we Christians maintain our God-created uniqueness, you know, it's our distinctive, distinctiveness, but we share a common vision and a common goal. The Stepford Wives was a 1975 movie that had a 2004 remake. The wives all looked and acted the same. We are not called to be Stepford Christians. God created us differently. Male, female, races, languages, talents, spiritual gifts, interests, all these things make us unique people. 
in your church and in your Sunday school class, let's strive for unity, not uniformity. Now notice Paul commanded them to keep this unity, not to establish it. You know, the band, I'm going back to the, the, the concert band analogy, uh, the band doesn't create the music as it goes along. No, it, it performs the music that was written by the composer. And since God is the author and the finisher of our faith, he calls us to preserve what he's already created. This unity is it's tied to our Christian character, and it can be accomplished only through the work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit can override human differences and, and hold us together through the bond of peace. And Peace is that harmony where, where there once existed conflict. And it, it acts like a belt, really, that, that holds us together. Well, in verses 4 through 6, Paul wrote that the operative word is one. There is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. The church is one body, unified by one spirit, called to one hope, worshiping one Lord, trusting with one faith, identified by one baptism, submitting to one God and Father. One is the key word. When we fail to keep the unity of the spirit, we deny the oneness that God has called us to. Cancer. It's a dreaded disease in which cells no longer want to unify with the body as a whole. Cancerous cells have their own independent, we'll call it vision and, and program. They want to stay in the body, but they want to do their own thing, and they multiply, and their goal is to shut you down. Similarly, Satan wants to shut down God's people, and he knows nothing will shut us down like disunity, since God's a God of order. Satan wants disunity. So let's think of disunity as a cancer in the church. In verse 7, Paul moved from what, we have, um, from what we have in common to how we differ from one another. Yes, Christ has given each believer grace, but it is given out personally. God's grace to me is not exactly the same as God's grace to you. And what does that mean? For, first, let's remind our students that the difference between mercy and grace, okay? Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Like the uh, person who's been convicted, he throws himself on the mercy of the court. Please don't give me the sentence that I deserve. But grace is receiving what we don't deserve. And if grace is something that we receive and we don't deserve it, then it's a gift. And it's a gift from God. God's gift to me is different than God's gift to you. Now, the gift we're the gift of grace we're talking about here, it, it's not the gift of salvation. That gift is for the individual's benefit, right? These gifts that we're talking about here, these gifts that God gives each believer are for the benefit of others, as we'll see better here in just a few minutes. So let's skip on down to verses 11 through 13 and look at these gifts. Now, note the purpose of spiritual gifts given in this passage. It's for, what, equipping people for God's work and mission, uh, for sanctification, that's the growing of our faith, becoming more like Jesus. It's also for the un to having unity in the faith, for spiritual maturity. Now, spiritual gifts are not given for our glory, but for the glory of God and for the good of others. We use our gifts to serve others. That's the main difference between a birthday gift or a Christmas gift and a spiritual gift. The wrapped gifts that are given or for the recipient, but not so for spiritual gifts. Remember that opening story I told about the blender? We are given spiritual gifts not for ourselves, but to serve the church, to build up other people, to build up God's kingdom. So regardless of what your gift is, you have been given a gift from God to help fulfill the mission of the church. Paul used the image of a body, there in verse 12, the body fitting together with every part serving a purpose. This is God's vision for the church. And in this passage, we, we see some specific gifts mentioned. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, please note, this is not an exhaustive list. Other gifts are mentioned in Romans 12, in 1 Peter 4, and in 1 Corinthians 12. These gifts that are listed here in this passage are, are leadership gifts. So we're going to briefly look at each of these, okay? Now, some may disagree with me, but I believe apostle here is not the office of of an apostle, like the 12 apostles that uh, had to have an eyewitness, uh, had to have witnessed Christ personally. I don't believe that's this. Uh, I believe this is a gift of apostleship because the Greek prefix, APO, 
like the beginning of the word apostle, it also begins the word apostasy. And that means to move away from the faith. And that's what uh, APO means, is it means away from. So the word apostle is one who has been sent forth, has been sent away. This is a leadership position that is sent forth or sent away. And what might we call that person today? I, th I believe it's a missionary. Well, next is prophet. Now, this is a spiritual leader gifted in receiving and communicating God's message. They can declare God's truth boldly and publicly for the, for the purpose of correction and instruction. Then there's the gift of the evangelist. This literally is the bringer of good news. This person has the God-given ability to effectively communicate the good news of Jesus Christ. And that leads non-believers to a, to a response. And then they can grow in their faith. Then there are pastors and teachers. And in Greek, this is one word, pastor-teacher. This is a shepherd. This is a mentor who can teach the truths of God's word. As you think about pastors in a local church, you can probably put him in one of those last three categories. His preaching style could fit into that of a prophet who boldly proclaims God's truth. Or maybe an evangelist who, one who effectively communicates the good news and people respond. Or as a pastor teacher, this is the, the category I put myself in. In fact, when I do preach, I, I really find it to be more of a time of teaching. So these are all spiritual gifts of leadership. And according to verse 12, what's the main job of leaders whom God has, uh, whom God has gifted this gift of leadership to? It's to equip the saints for work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. So we church leaders are really bodybuilders, right? Now, notice that leaders are to equip the people to do, not to do it all themselves. And that's the trap that so many pastors find themselves in, whether it's self-imposed or maybe expected by the congregation. Now, certainly, I believe the church staff, uh, we're members of the church as well, and so nothing is really beneath us. If there's a church work day, we need to be there. If there's a piece of trash on the church lawn, and I'm, I see it and I'm close by, then I should pick it up. But... I can't be an effective pastor and bodybuilder if I'm the only one picking up trash, if I'm the only one trimming the hedges, and, and so forth. I, re I recently read a want ad for a part-time pastor position in my state, and the job description included unlocking the building, buying food for the Wednesday night supper, turning off, on, off and on all the lights, turning on and off all the audio and visual equipment, making sure that the bathroom paper products were stocked, and I'm not sure when the pastor would have time to build up the body after doing all those things. So, if, if the purpose of the gifts is to build up Christ's body, which is the church, what's the outcome of using these gifts? In other words, what should be the result of everyone using their gifts? Paul said that that outcome of using everyone using their spiritual gifts is unity, knowledge of Jesus, and maturity. Let's now look at our last set of scriptures, Ephesians 4, verses 14 through 16. Well, in the last section that we just read, we saw that uh, one of the results of everyone using their spiritual gifts is spiritual maturity. We won't be babies in the faith anymore. With maturity comes discernment. And that means that a spiritually mature person will be able to tell the difference between true biblical teaching and false heretical teaching. We need to be stabilized by maturity, and, and maturity only comes when we're connected to each other. In verse 15, we see that to mature, to grow in every way, we must be in an environment of speaking the truth in love. Okay, You see, truth is what God says about a matter, and truth must reign. And it, it sometimes isn't pretty when truth confronts our sin, but truth can't be used like a destructive hammer. It must be spoken with love, which involves compassionately, righteously, and responsibly seeking the well-being, not the humiliation, of its recipient. Well, in verse 16, Paul says that the body grows with the proper working of each individual part when it is fitted and knit together. The body is built up with, uh, when, when the various parts cooperate and contribute to the whole. California has some of the largest organisms on the planet, the redwood trees. They grow massive in size and, and ancient in age. They, the, the secret to their stability and growth is that their roots intertwine. Underground, they're all interconnected. You can't mess with one without messing with the whole grove. 
when fierce winds blow, their connectedness allows them to borrow from one another and grow strong. So it is, Paul says, with the body of Christ. And Paul concludes this section by referring to the church as a body with Christ as its head. A healthy church with members exercising their gifts, not for self-promotion, not for self-glory, but for the spiritual growth of the body, they will be identified by love. Love for each other, love for Christ, and love for those who are without Christ. In other words, the gifts of the Spirit should produce the fruit of the Spirit that God desires to produce in all of His children. And we see the fruit of the Spirit listed, of course, in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. Here's one final thought. As you think about your church, what area do you find yourself most critical of? Okay, What's the area in which you think your church could really do a better job? That probably is a good indicator of your spiritual gift. If you think your church doesn't do enough to minister to the down and out in your community, you might have the gift of mercy. If you think your pastor spends too many sermons preaching evangelistic messages, perhaps you, perhaps you have the gift of teaching. Okay. Well, next week, we're going to be looking at the last lesson in this unit. It's called Doing Life Together in Christ. And it's going to be out of 1 Thessalonians 5. Thank you guys so much for watching. I do appreciate you. Don't forget, pray for and with your class. Thank you.